Brian, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Wonderful to be here. Hey, I'm excited to have another Harry Potter fan here with me. <laughs> now, I, I, I'm making an assumption there after reading The Geometry of Wealth, uh, which I truly enjoyed that read. It made me think... Uh, not just about my life, but the lives of others, lives of the families we work with. So many meaningful conversations in there. And right off the top, you said money is the Lord Voldemort of topics. <laughs> that's, that's right. So, yes, Harry Potter fan. Um, I have three kids. They're now teenagers, but they, they didn't used to be. So we, we went through a Harry Potter phase. And... Um, yeah, Lord, Lord Voldemort, meaning that it's uh, something that we don't want to talk about that sort of lurks in our mind as something dangerous, a, a specter, and money is like that. We find it a very intimidating topic. It's, it's stressful, and, and we generally lack um, financial education uh, in our educational system. So it, it becomes something that we want to stay away from, even though we can't. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I noticed that you, uh, referred to several children's books throughout your book, um, uh -huh. being Dr. Seuss. I yes. saw that as well. So oh, the, I can oh, definitely tell you had some young kids at the time. Yeah. Um, although I think uh, you, you probably would agree that the best child, the, the best children's literature is often the most insightful into our humanity. And um, so some of the things that I referenced in the book in terms of Dr. Seuss or Harry Potter, I, I think they're very revealing into the things that matter. Oh, I do. And, you know, the whole book, I felt like, so I'm about 75% of the way through the book. So I, I regret to say that I did not completely finish the book, but I'm 75% of the way through the geometry of wealth, written by a PhD, a CFA, someone that grew up in the hedge fund world, and I have yet to see you discuss portfolio construction, uh, stock selection, uh, good mutual funds, bad mutual funds, uh, the appropriate amount of risk to take with a portfolio. I, and I think it's very rare to make it 75% of the way through a finance book without talking about specific investments or tools. Why did you structure it the way that you did? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and the answer uh, is that Geometry of Wealth is actually a prequel. So talk about other cultural references. I'm a Star Wars nerd. So the idea of a prequel uh, also appeals to me. I, I had written a book some, some years ago called The Investor's Paradox, which got into making better investment decisions. And, and maybe we'll talk about this field of behavioral finance. I know it's an interest of yours and you've had some great guests on in the past, but behavioral finance is the study of why money decisions are so difficult. And um, that, I'm very proud of that effort, but it occurred to me both professionally and personally as a husband, as a father, as a son to aging parents that the hard part of money actually isn't the stocks and bonds. Yes, you can make mistakes. Uh, yes, there are better and worse ways to invest, but there's a whole host of decisions and attitudes as well as values that come into the money story. And I, I wanted to take those seriously again, not only as a professional investor and a student of market history, but as just a, a guy in the world who's trying to, to figure things out. So the premise of the geometry of wealth is let's start at the beginning. Let, let's talk about what really matters. And then let's get to uh, maybe uh, having some thoughts into the way money fits into a meaningful life. Well, and off the top, you, know, you, you talk about, you, know, you focus on this concept of wealthy versus rich. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really helpful. You know, when I was a little kid, uh, we didn't have much initially. I uh, lived in an apartment complex, dad flipped some houses, and I uh, ended up becoming fairly successful uh, mm -hmm. due to all the hard work and blood, sweat, and tears that he put in. And, you know, some would call us rich. And my dad and mom would always say, we're not rich, we're wealthy. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know that I ever really understood what they meant by that until I read it in your book. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a really important distinction and, and, and hopefully people don't think of it as just a semantic uh, one. What I mean by rich versus wealthy is rich is having more money and the things that, that money buys. Wealthy, by contrast, is the ability to underwrite a meaningful life. Um, and, and there's a lot going on in that second sentence, underwrite a meaningful life. So 
what, what is meaningful and then what does it mean to underwrite meaning? How awkward is it to ask, can I afford a meaningful life? It makes us feel almost kind of, kind of, kind of icky. Yeah. So I develop in the book a, a concept, the concept of funded contentment, which, which kind of gets into the way we want to bridge purpose and, and planning. And just to comment on the word rich for a second, uh, all societies, but especially American society, is very much focused on the accumulation of more. And that that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's a good thing. That's part of the pioneer spirit. That's part of, you know, the 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 the, the value of, of growth and success and prosperity and progress. That's a really good thing. But what we know in a fair amount of detail from social psychology and 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 other academic disciplines that look into the human psyche is that <clears throat> the quest for more is often very unsatisfying. And the reason why things like having more money, beauty, fame, even accomplishment don't necessarily make us as happy as we think that it will is because we're on something called the hedonic treadmill, this idea that we're sprinting toward the next thing but we know on a treadmill, no matter how fast you run, you don't get any further. And when we achieve goals, whether it be raising our kids or getting the next home or the vacation home or even retirement, the, the, the really big topic so many of us are focused on, we often get to those goals and we win. And we still say, what's next? So I wanted to pivot the conversation away from rich, which is the quest for more, and focus it on wealthy which uh, uh, brings us into this notion of funded contentment. Well, how do we get past that? I mean, I, you know, I, I've had many of these conversations where I'll say, well, you have enough, right? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, what's enough? You know, many advisors are having those conversations. And I think many of us ask that question, you know, how much is enough? Mm -hmm. And then when we get to enough, it doesn't seem like enough. Right. You know, how do we how do we know what enough is? What's that really mean in, in the end? And how do we, how are we just content with that? How do we finally reach this point where we're content, we have enough, and then we can move on with life? It's the hardest question. And the good news for you is, is that the last chapter of the book is all about the tension between more and enough. Um, it, it's unresolved in my mind, but I'll share a couple of thoughts. Um, the, the first is that both the uh, quest for more and the satisfaction of enough are genetically hardwired into us. They're both valuable. That, that um, sense of growth and self-determination is super important um, for our identity and the way we live our lives. And at the same time, that sense of calm, stillness, presence, enough, also from a neurobiological point of view, super important. So the thing is, you, you can't stand still and run at, at the same time, they, they are mutually exclusive at any moment in time. And so one thing I've been thinking about, uh, might even be the next book, is how do we establish a rhythm between more versus enough and not deny the importance of either in our lives and try to reconcile that it's not so much about balance and that we're always trying to have it just right. We're, we're going to drive ourselves a little nutty in the search for balance, but instead try to find the rhythm and at least be self-aware to know that sometimes you're in the mode of more, sometimes you're in the mode of enough. They're equally valid and we just need to navigate it. And sometimes there are conflicts and tensions in our life that are irresolvable, which isn't to say that they aren't edifying and an opportunity for growth and accomplishment and meaning. Is this why in the book you say financial wellness is an uphill battle? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, going back to the idea that money is a very emotional topic. You know, we, we learn in grade school that, you know, money is a, a means of exchange or a store of value. But what it actually is is an emotional lightning rod that captures or attracts fear, greed, hope, joy, regret, envy, you name it. It, it, it's it's a, a window through which we can see ourselves. And if you think about what I call money life, which is not, just not investing, but having a job, saving, spending, insuring, giving charitably, as well as investing uh, and, and, and so forth, not a day goes by when we're not making multiple money decisions. Mm. It's just unavoidable. Um, and so 
financial wellness is an uphill battle because it triggers in us uh, uh, just the core emotions that we feel and attaches to our identity. Uh, who, who are we? Well, it's hard to answer that absent some self-understanding of where money fits into your life. It, it's, it's difficult. We don't want to talk about it. We're much more likely to talk about you know, our health or our friendships uh, or religion or even politics, you know, topics that can sometimes be very sensitive. We'll, we'll talk about all of that before we know about money. Just think about the fact that most of us probably know that, know everything about our best friend in terms of health, marriage. How much does your best friend make? Does your best friend have a balance sheet? What's his balance between assets and liabilities? Does he have a budget? <laughs> Number one, we don't know. Number two, we don't want to know. It's super awkward, even though he or she is sharing with you every other intimate secret in their life. That was kind of a, a, a epiphany for me, if you will, because I you, you said that in the book. I read that. I go, actually, I know exactly what all my best friends make, exactly what their balance sheet looks like. <laughs> but well, you do but I'm in a weird it. position, right? Yeah. It's like I, I like having these conversations. I think we should talk about money. We just don't talk about it enough. It's, it's not open enough in our society and accepted enough in our society where we can have these conversations. Yeah. Uh, but it should be. And, and I guess I'm just in a, a, a weird place. Do, do you think we, we, we need to talk about money with our best friends, though? I mean, it, you, you say that, yeah, you don't know that. Do we need to know? We don't necessarily need to know. In what the are the benefits, sense? I guess? Yeah, we don't, you know. So I, I positioned it in terms of talking to your best friend. You know, um, I also, you know, to an earlier point, I'm not a real doctor. I'm a PhD. So my friend might have some health issues. <clears throat> he could share with me, you know, the, the pain or fear or hope of, of whatever that situation is. But he should seek professional help. <laughs> I, I, can be, I can be supportive. I think what's really interesting and it you know, speaks to what you've built and other friends in the industry have in our building is this idea that you know, the wealth management industry, the financial advice business, not that long ago, just a generation ago, was a brokerage business mm -hmm. selling stuff. Hey, um, you, know, you, you like IBM <clears throat> or you, you, know, you like uh, General Electric and, and you want to buy stock, you know, 30, 40 years ago, access to the capital markets was very difficult. You had to go through a broker. Fast forward to today, technology has obliterated all of that. And along the way, through that process, you know, what, what uh, some political scientists would call creative destruction in, in our industry, um, brokerage, somewhat commoditized, um, allocating and investing, super important, but now a lot of people do it. And our industry has evolved to a place where um, providing so-called more holistic planning, life coaching, and giving people the tools and the vocabulary to help them figure out where money fits into the life they want to lead. Compare that to a stockbroker 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, it's a radical change in the industry. And I think you, you and I and, and colleagues in the industry, we're thinking about this every day, but most people have much better things to do with their time than think about the evolution of our industry. And so Part of what I want to continue to do is communicate the value that advisors and coaches, coaches and educators have in this area because almost nobody uh, would think twice or, or look askance at, at somebody who hired a, a coach at the gym to help them to get into better shape. Or maybe you need a dietitian and get on a better path with your food. But when it comes to money, the idea that you would have a guide, a coach, um, you know, not a guru, not, not a, you know, not a therapist per se, but just somebody who helps you make decisions. It's a funny thing, but it's just in the last 15, 20 years that this has become a, a something real. So we need to have meaningful conversations around money. Uh, however, we don't need to have those conversations with our best friend. We need to be having them with somebody. And that's where shaping wealth came into play, right? You're, is that kind of the premise around shaping wealth? And, and I also want to provide some guidance to folks because we, we still get these questions on a regular basis where oh. how do I know that someone's putting together a true financial plan for me versus just give me, giving me investment advice? Right, right, right. So a couple things. It's hard One, to figure out. I think it's, it's difficult to, to tell the difference for the average individual. 
It is, it is. And so what we as advisors, educators, coaches need to do is um, articulate what we're doing better than we have. Um, because the idea that you turn on CNBC and you watch a bunch of red and green numbers go across the screen and people are saying, well, you know, uh, ExxonMobil is going to go up or it's going to go down. We need to do a much better job educating not only our clients, but the general public on what the real game is here. And and the real game is attaching money to uh, a meaningful life. So, you know, Shaping Wealth, yes, a, a relatively new firm that I launched that works with financial advisors, individual investors, corporate financial wellness programs uh, that, uh, to provide content coaching and, and, and consulting on a lot of these things, providing the, the words and the scripts. And as you saw in my book, I, I like to draw pictures. Um, the, the brain processes images 60,000 times faster than words. But in the financial industry, we seem stuck with spreadsheets and Excel and numbers and, you know, uh, 2.44 is much more than 2.43. No, they're the same number. We get so wrapped up. We need to do a much better job at communicating that. And I would like to, you know, be part of that solution. Not, and not just for, you know, people who have money, but I've been pretty active in um, the financial literacy movement. And there's a lot of interesting things taking place in terms of how we can connect to families from all walks of life to, to give them some perspective on, on money. Well, let's get back to this meaningfulness. So you brought up a meaningful life several times. Um, you talk about purpose in the book uh, quite a bit. What, mm-hmm. what is the difference between meaning and purpose and what do they mean to you? Yeah, um, so sometimes I, I, I use them a bit interchangeably. Um, I'll take a step back and ask the question, what is, what is happiness? What does it mean to be happy? And, and, and one thing I've, I've seen in the research uh, from lots of different directions, psychology, economics, neuroscience, and, and so forth, is that there's sort of a fork in the road between what I call experienced happiness and reflective happiness. And this is going to get us to the question about meaning, meaning and purpose. Experienced happiness is our day-to-day, meaning you wake up, you're in a good mood, you're in a bad mood, um, you know, it's your birthday, you're happy, uh, some, so, something tragic happened, you're sad. That, that form of happiness, um, and going back 2,400 years to debates among Aristotle and his, and, and his cohort, that spectrum of pain versus pleasure that's our daily experience. It, it's not shallow. It, it's not secondary. That That is our core experience. But there is also something going on in our minds and, frankly, in our souls that I call reflective happiness. Uh, and again, there's neurological basis for this as well. So it's just not fluff or literature. Um, reflective happiness is that deeper sense of what, what's going on with my life? Am I living my best life? From a brain chemistry point of view, it's harder to engage in that deep thinking. Our, our brains are quite lazy uh, in a good way. Our brains are about 2% of our body weight and 25% of our energy consumption. So it's always figuring out ways to, to, to take shortcuts. So we don't want to spend too much time sitting around saying, what's a meaningful life? You know, what, what is my purpose? It's super important. Um, if we don't do it, we're missing something. At the same time, it's, it, it, it's exhausting. So I'd like to distinguish between that day-to-day pain versus pleasure, ephemeral happiness gets us back to that hedonic treadmill or he, that, that, that I mentioned. And then on the other fork is this reflective happiness, this step, I call it the step back. Like, huh, are things going the way that I had hoped for? And what can I do differently? What are my regrets? Can I anticipate future regrets, which is a whole mode of thinking, which I find interesting. And then we say, and we can use the word meaning or, or, or purpose here, that there's something deeper that we want to achieve. Well, uh, I, I might be in trouble because I'm thinking about meaning and purpose, I think, almost every day. I might maybe, and, and you said there's some danger, and I just never heard that. I've never heard anybody say that it's dangerous to spend too much time reflecting on meaning and purpose. I always thought there was a, a tremendous amount of value in that, so it lends itself to the question, 
well, how much is enough? How, how much should I focus on this? How, how important should it be in my life? How do, I, how do I focus on it in a healthy way? Right, right. Well, for you and for me, it's sort of what we do for a living. Like it's become our, our passion. So I think our, our, our minds are probably warmed up. So we're, we're, happy to, we're happy to have these conversations with friends and colleagues and clients at, at, at every day. Um, I think most people just want to get on with their lives and don't want to every day think about what's my greater purpose. Um, and so, you know, part of my perspective is that we want to marry purpose with planning. So, um, you know, why I wrote this book second uh, uh, and why it's a, a so-called prequel is that I recognize that, well, there's the investment decisions, but prior to that, you need a plan because, um, allocating capital into the market without a plan, I would call speculating or gambling, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I'm not, ca- ca- you know, casting a terrible value judgment. Um, but I think, um, you know, buy- buying stocks or bonds that isn't attached to a specific goal, we would count that as speculation. And lots of people do it. And in moderation, maybe it's fine. I don't know if that's worth 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 debating. So prior to the investing piece we need to have a, a plan. We have to have an articulation of goals and the types of cash flows or lump sum payments that we need to um, underwrite those goals. But prior to goals is, is the sense of purpose that we need to get into. Uh, the notion of goals is tricky and, and probably more confusing than, than people give credit to because number one, and, and we know this from a lot of social psychology research, we're pretty bad at predicting what we want in the future. And number two, even when we achieve what we want, the intensity and the duration of the emotions that we expect to feel are much weaker and shorter than we anticipate. So we win the lottery, great, have a big party. A week or four weeks later, we're sort of just back to who we were. And so uh, uh, assembling that chain from from purpose to goals to plans to to investment and other money life decisions is where we need to get people. And you do this for a living. I do it uh, from, a, from a slightly different perspective, but this is a skill. And I think we are in a wonderful position to help people have better lives um, if we bring them along a process and make clear what that process is from the start. Mm-hmm. Well, I think one of the things that makes purpose so difficult to define is because we're trying to define it at one point in time. We're trying to say, this is my purpose. And that is something that's going to last into perpetuity. And that was one of my uh, favorite things about your book is it, it's about geometry and the, the circular yeah. nature of purpose. Can you just talk about why you made purpose a mm-hmm. circle when it comes to the circle, the square, the triangle, and maybe we need to offer some context here on what, yeah, what yeah, the yeah. circle and square and triangle really mean. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a show and tell. I, I don't have uh, placards or note cards or anything. But um, yeah, you know, I've been influenced again to a point I made a little while ago. Of, of you know, people in our industry who have actually drawn pictures and created simple messages that respects the person across the table, as opposed to what a lot of our industry not only was but still is, which is a ton of numbers and it's intimidating. And we then unfortunately get involved with effectively theater where, you know, the, the investment or the financial expert is playing the role of expert and the client across the table is trying to keep up, but they probably don't fully understand what's going on, but they'd be embarrassed to say, it's funny, my, my dad has a financial advisor and every six months I, I call, he calls me to say he had the conversation. Um, and I ask, well, you know, did you understand what he was explaining to you about your portfolio? No. <laughs> he, he said he, he said he sent us a, a lot of uh, uh, spreadsheets and, and numbers. And uh, by the way, his advisor is quite good. But but yeah, he walks through all the numbers. And yeah, I, I don't know what this mutual fund is. Or oh, you're going to swap this out for that. He, my dad's like, I, I, I don't know what any of this means. Mm-hmm. And um but then my dad says, are, he does answer the one question that they worry about, which is, am I going to be okay? You know, they're, they're, they're stepping way back immediately saying, okay, I'm, I'm glad you, the expert, are putting all of this together. 
And speaking of my dad, you know, he said something when I was young, which has stuck with me, which is it's a round world. Things happen. Um, we're never done figuring, uh, figuring things out. Um, you know, I can think about, um, you know, the stage of stages of my life and, you know, the idea that the way I was in my twenties and thirties is not at all the way that I am today. I was sort of the same person, but, but we change. And I think those who are willing to embrace an adaptive mindset are in a much better position to have a wonderful and meaning life than those who are absolutely rigid because, you know, the maybe too famous quote from, from Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Mm -hmm. We get punched in the face every day in little ways. And every now and then we really get socked in the face. Um, I don't know anybody whose life has gone according to plan or what they could have predicted. So having that adaptive mindset and thinking about the circle and that we're going to be asking ourselves these questions. And when I mentioned earlier, you know, it's dangerous to do this too much. It's more exhausting than it is dangerous. We, we don't want to sit around every day um, asking what's a meaningful life. We want to spend time with our kids or grandkids. We want to go golfing. Making it meaningful. Yeah, we, we want to do it. We want to, yeah. we, we want to live it. And so the circle is supposed to capture the simple idea that we are permitted to not have all the answers at any moment in time and recognize that everybody is on a journey where they're kind of, they're kind of winging it. Yeah. Well, that, that begs the question, you know, we, you talk about in the book that we don't know what our goals are and that makes planning incredibly difficult. You said, and so I thought, well, then what is an appropriate and meaningful retirement goal? And maybe, maybe we should separate that out between a, a meaningful uh, purpose or a, an appropriate purpose for retirement and an appropriate goal for retirement. I'm, I'm really glad you brought up this topic. I've been thinking about it a, a fair bit lately. Um, retirement's a funny thing. You, you know, um, you, you know the history. You know, more than a couple hundred years ago, there wasn't retirement. You, you kind of worked till you died, or you couldn't work anymore, and you were part of a larger family unit, and they, 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 they took care of you. I, I rewatched for the hundredth time uh, the original Willy Wonka the other night with my uh, third. 13 year old daughter. Um, it's really one of my top five movies of all time. It's brilliant on so many levels. And, you know, Grandpa Joe and, and Grandma Josephine, I mean, they're sitting in that bed for 20 years. And that was the family unit, really um, uh, not, not, that, not that long ago. Fast forward to today, you know, we have a system where at age 62 or 65, whatever the number is, you quote unquote stop working and then you can enjoy life. And mm -hmm. while there's nothing wrong with the notion that at a certain point you're tired, uh, may, may, maybe you, you can't sell your labor in, into the market in the way that you once could, you know, totally normal and, and legitimate. Th this idea that many of us are living on a script that says, develop a deep sense of identity based around your craft and your vocation and your professional passion, as well as the people that you share that with, and do that so well that you have enough money to stop doing it. Well, what happens to all of the meaning and identity and connection related to your work that stops and then needs to be filled by something else? And so this retirement script that uh, we all, to some extent, have bought into, so I'm 100 percent and don't even think twice about it. Uh, I'm sure you've thought, you know, you do this for a living. You've thought about it very, very deeply. What, what is, what, what are we doing? So when we talk about retirement and someone, you know, age 30, 40, 50, really begins to plan for this, is the goal here to not work? Is the goal here to stop working? It may be, in fact, that like your passion is playing golf and you want to play seven days a week. That's totally fine. This is the, you know, this, this is a space where everyone should do exactly whatever it is they, they want. But I think there needs to be, from the financial advice community, the encouragement to think a little bit differently about what are you gaining and losing from, quote unquote, retiring? And are there sources of meaning 
and, and, and I, in the book, I talk about four broad um, sources of contentment. Maybe we can get into that. Um, what are the things along the way before you get to 60 or 62 or 65 that you can be engaging in so that you aren't forcefully putting yourself on this so-called hedonic treadmill? Because I know, you know, I've, I've counseled and, and talked to hundreds of financial advisors over the years, spoken to thousands uh, at, at, at different conferences. And increasingly, as longevity expands, which is, I think, a net positive, people live late, late into their 80s, into their, in, into their 90s, someone does everything that they should. They take your advice, they save well, they, they spend responsibly, they make smart investment decisions. And they sit down with you at age 62 and you say, like, high five. Like, you did it. You, you, you won the race. What I've heard back from so many advisors at this point is that increasingly the couple across the table and, frankly, the man says, well, what's next? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I got here. I, I got 30 years to go. And I'm still relatively healthy and vibrant. You know, today, 60-year-olds are last generation's, you know, 45 or 50-year-olds. You know, we're connected through technology. We travel. We've got all these toys and, and, and fun things. So I think rescripting that retirement narrative is going to be one of the great challenges uh, uh, for our industry and for our clients in, in the generation to come. And, and I'm looking forward to it. I actually think it's going to be a very fun conversation. Mm -hmm. I think that is, I mean, that's exactly what we titled the book, Job Optional. Yeah. Right? I, I mean, I, exactly. I think that's, it, it's, it's financial freedom, right? At, at the yeah. base level. But, you know, it doesn't mean that we don't want to continue to work. We just don't want to continue to work for money that we need mm -hmm. necessarily, right? And I, I think your four C's, I just feel like we have to go there at this point because uh, those four C's, as I see, as I see it, they really, um, they form a meaningful life. They, that is, you know, a, a daily purpose. That is a, a lifetime of purpose. Mm -hmm. If we can incorporate all four of these things into our lives, connection, control, competence, context. And as you said here, I mean, one of those four being competence. Yeah. If we have this high level of competence in one area that we've lived our entire lives by, we've defined ourselves by, and now that's gone. You know, what do we do? Right, right. Um, well, let me, let, let, let me elaborate a little bit on, on those just so folks know what I'm talking about or what, what, what we're talking about. Um, so, you know, part of the task I set out in, in this book in writing about the ability to underwrite a meaningful life was to answer, well, what's a meaningful life? And, you know, it's sort of, uh, it, it's such an absurdly large, large question, but at the same time, everyone has the right and in some sense an obligation. Uh, to, to try to come up with an answer. So, so I did. Um, you know, uh, I have been thinking about this just as a normal human being for a, a, a few decades, but I, I made it a purpose to do a lot of directed reading in psychology, theology, super important, um, philosophy, uh, neuroscience, and, and just sort of bring together a lot of different threads and I, I'm, you know, hardly the first. I'm, I'm the hundred millionth person to try to come up with a framework. And what I came up with, just for the sake of a mnemonic, was the four C's, like you said, connection, control, competence, and context. And they are in brief, and we can go into any of them if you like. The first is connection. And I always put that first because we are at our very root social beings. We don't just want to be around others. We need to be around others. So our, our genetic makeup is such that we have uh, an intimate need to feel attached to a larger whole. Uh, we're small T tribal, uh, not the big T bad political tribal. Uh, we operate in groups. And one of the challenges now, even with, if we say we're introverts, you know, that's, is that, we still that, need that, human connection. Right. Yes, yes. Just because you're an introvert doesn't mean that you doesn't mean you don't. Introvert doesn't mean I don't need human connection. It means that you need it in a form and a pace and, and a scale that works for you. You know, so the, the need for connection or belonging doesn't um, a, a eliminate a lot of kind of personal dispositions, um, but it is kind of unflappably important as the core of our identity. 
The, the second C is control, which is self-determination, autonomy, the pursuit of liberty, um, just the sense that you do what you want to do. No, no, one, no one really likes being told what they can do uh, or what they have to do. And um, so, you know, one of the things about this sense of control is that it's not just a physical, oh, I can go where I want and do what I want. It's also the, the autonomy to tell your own story. One of the reasons why I think many of us uh, find um, certain movies about uh, prisoners to be, can be so inspirational, and I'm thinking of The Shawshank Redemption and Andy Dufresne and what a wonderful film that is, also in my top five, along with uh, Willy Wonka. I watch a lot of movies. Um, you know, we think about people who have been physically imprisoned, you know, rightly or wrongly, but their ability to tell their story and uh, live a life in their mind and beyond their mind is very inspirational. So that ability to, 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 to tell our story is, is huge. The, the third C we touched on, competence. It, it, it's that sense of identity you get from your work and there's a deeper state of being that some scientists call flow, which is that, that, that moment or that episode when you're doing something that you absolutely love. For me, it's, it's writing. For others, it could be playing an instrument. It could just be whatever their craft is, um, their hobby. And you look up and it's three hours later. Like, what happened? That's a very healthy state to be. And then the, the fourth C is context which is the biggest of them all and, and sort of a, a, a little bit of a catch-all. Um, and, and that's the uh, notion that people who have been seen to live for something beyond themselves tend to lead happier, more meaningful lives. And so this is faith. This is nation. It's also your sports team. It's something beyond you. Uh, there's no right or wrong answer as what kind of fills that bucket, but that connection to others um, or to an idea is, is super important. And so what I did, uh, and hopefully, you know, folks find it helpful, was just create a very simple mental model based on these four Cs. They're not, it's not a scorecard. You're, you're not trying to get 10 on each. And if you get a 40, you, you have a super meaningful life and you win. Like that, 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 this is not a game at all, let alone a game like that. But it's just a mental model and, and, and some words that I think give us um, a framework to think through what's important at a moment in time. And one thing I've done with some clients is to say, well, think about your life uh, uh, from beginning to right now. And, and whatever the division, wh whatever the, the eras or segments are, that, that's entirely up to you. It could be as simple as you know, childhood, adolescence, young adult, married, kids, what, what, you know, that's standard. But whatever your framework is, there could be certain life events that that, that, that mark things off for you. And then think about the four C's, those deep underlying sources of, of meaning, and what was important to you. And what I found, and I've done this for myself, um, what I found in myself and others is that the narrative changes. There, there are times when connection to others is everything, that sense of family, that sense mm -hmm. of love. There are other times and it could be a day or a time of the day or a, a, a few year period where control, autonomy, that sense of power, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get stuff done, um, could, could be what's really defining you. And so one of the tools I've created is this sort of just mental map where you retell your life story through what was meaningful to you over time. Number one, to illuminate, to just be more self-aware. Number two, to give you the lesson that things change. You know, back to our circle, we're always adapting. Um, and three, recognize that the path forward is unknown and unknowable, but very exciting. Like, there's a lot to do with this. Yeah, I, I, I still want a scorecard. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a natural human need or desire. You know, we, we want to measure ourselves against everyone else. We want to know where we stand. Are we uh, on the four C's? Are we a hundred percent or are we right. uh, 60 and we need something to work on? And um, I, 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 I it, so if we look at this, and that was going to be my question, are they equally important? And it sounds like they, 
they're not they they are equally important but it's going to evolve the importance of each one's going to evolve over time is that what i hear you saying i think so i mean it's going to be however it works out and, and you could be intentional um you can be deliberate about kind of tapping into sources of a of a good life that maybe was what was missing um but um you know, it's funny what you say about this. I joke about the scorecard, and we're joking about the scorecard. People want a scorecard. Um, but I will say this. If um, your measure of what counts as a meaningful life um, is relative to the lives of others, it's going to be less satisfying. Um, you know, you've probably heard the old quote from uh, from from the original J.P. Morgan in going back 100 plus years, who said that um, nothing corrupts one's financial judgment worse than the sight of your neighbors getting rich. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, there's there's no getting around, you know, our connection to others. And then part of that is envy and comparison. And uh, we can't eliminate that, but we can certainly contextualize it. And um, you know, may, may, maybe use that as, as, as an engine of growth. And, and the second point I'll make about the scorecard, which I think is important for people, is that it's hard to score 40, and it's ridiculous to even talk about it that way, because these are sometimes in, con in, in conflict with each other. And the big is connection versus, versus control. You're connected to a group. You have a sense of belonging. You're, you're in your tribe. You go along. Your, your identity is formed by that. And at the same time, you want to do your own thing. You want to chart your own course. Um, uh, being part of the group and doing your own thing at any moment in time could be in direct conflict. And so um, these are sources of meaning generally, but the idea that we can max them all out at all times is, is, is a little bit silly. Absolutely. And so we've got connection, control, competence, context. I see all of these things as things that can develop a meaningful retirement. We've talked about this yep. with so many different guests, staying socially connected, continuing to set goals, uh, take analyzing your career and finding that there's usually something in there you actually enjoyed, pulling that into retirement with you and having some context, having some faith, serving a higher purpose. Maybe yep. that's volunteering, whatever that might mean for you. Right. And so wh where does where does money fit in to this equation? Where does money fit into the four C's here? So now we, we start the, the real conversation. <laughs> only, only five more hours to go. No, just kidding. Um, where's money fit into this? Um, let me just answer it by saying that the big mental model that I try to deliver, the ingredients are on the box, the, the three shapes, the circle, the triangle, the square, is is to say that there's a relationship between defining purpose, setting priorities, including financial priorities, and then making decisions, um, especially money decisions, and not just investing, but saving and spend, saving, spending, insuring, giving, and, 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 and so forth. Um, so money fits into this because, you know, coming full circle from where we started, it's an inescapable topic. Uh, there's just no getting around um, the need to have a roof over our head and food on, on our table at minimum. And so um, because and that, I got to say, I, I don't want to interrupt just because yeah. as I'm thinking, you, you don't need money for the four C's, right? I mean, can I, you context, don't. competence, control, connection. I don't I don't see a need for money in there necessarily. Uh, it's it's. So you're you're right to some extent, um, but um, one I don't thing I'm mind that, being wrong, Brian. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I, I'm I'm professionally wrong. It's what I it, it it's what I do. So what you're doing is 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 touching on uh, a a real um, kind of ambiguous area in the the scientific research on the relationship between money and happiness. So. Um, there is a relationship between money and happiness in terms of being able to have a roof over your head, uh, to, to, to feeling safe. Uh, so if we think about uh, the distinction between winning a game versus not losing a game, from a genetic evolutionary point of view, we're hardwired more so to not lose than we are to win. There, there's a principle known as loss aversion. It's the idea that losses are two to three times more painful than gains are. Uh, then gains are pleasurable. And so our disposition is to be safe because 
on any given day, you don't have to win the game of life. But on any given day, if you lose it, there, there's not a repeat button. You can't put a quarter in the slot and play the game again. So we are wired. Those of us who are here, our, our disposition from an evolutionary chain is that survival is everything. We, we first survive and then we thrive. And so having resources, money to survive, critically important. And um, unfortunately, as you know, we live in a society where that's not the case for everyone. Um, you know, pe pe people do struggle and that has significant psychological impacts on them. So there is up until the point where we can afford um, those necessities, uh, a pretty strong relationship. Beyond that, the day-to-day -day happiness is not really associated uh, with our level of income. So you can go from a hundred grand to a million and it doesn't really change kind of your day-to-day -day disposition. But there is now research that shows as it pertains to reflective happiness, the, the, the four C's, these sources of meaning, that as you have more and more financial security, you can indulge in these things more and more. So you don't- You can indulge specifically in more focus on the four C's. Correct. So in terms of community um, or connection, I should say, you know, the ability to uh, uh, afford the membership dues and to be part of the club, that's just a very practical part of it, whether it's your club or your church or your synagogue or, 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 or whatever, you know, the venue is. Um, control pretty, I think it's easy to make a case there that that money makes a difference. They, um, I'm not going to describe the type of money that people say they have when they can tell other people to go pound sand, but basically, you know, you can, um, control your destiny a little bit better when you have the resources to not be, um, uh, obligated to, to, to serve others. Um, money and competence. There's no getting around the fact that all of us work for a living in part for that paycheck. And so there are some you know, sort of deep emotional um, uh, fissures there. And then finally, context. I think that's, that's, that, that's a tough one. Have, having a sense of mm -hmm. obligation toward others. Yeah, I, I, I would argue with you perhaps that there's a pretty ambiguous relationship between ha having money and, and your ability to live for something you know, be, beyond yourself. But the fact is that, you know, and I, and I talk about seven dimensions of, of money life, earning, saving, spending, investing, insuring, um, and giving. I think that was six or seven. Um, borrowing, that, that's the seventh. Um, across all of those dimensions, we get triggered in certain ways that impacts how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about our communities. Yeah, it seems like, yeah. The, the question, or what you said in the book, you said money alleviates sadness more than it inspires joy. Correct. And I feel like that, that fit, does that fit in here? It does. It does, because it gets to this issue of uh, loss aversion or risk aversion, the idea that we don't have to thrive, but we have to survive. And so alleviating sadness, alleviating pain, um, I, I think is prior to achievement, having more, gaining happiness, how, however you want to put it. So um, there's actually not been much scholarship on this topic. The, the first serious large-scale study of the relationship between money and sadness was published in 2014. So, you know, think basically now. Um, but uh, what I've seen so far, uh, you know, from scientists, uh, from psychologists, social psychologists and such, is that um, money alleviates aggravation, sadness, um, uh, in a pretty direct way. Um, think even about beyond it. that seventy-five thousand dollars that we always hear. Yes, yeah, the that and that seventy-five thousand dollar number that gets tossed around in the in, in the literature, um, beyond which it's you know it's claimed that money doesn't buy more happiness. Um, that number is difficult um, to. To talk about because Manhattan, New York versus Manhattan, Kansas, seventy-five thousand dollars means yeah. something very different. Um, but you know, having um, you know the 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 roof is leaking, the ability to just get the roof fixed, or to have a house where the roof would never leak, 
that's an alleviation of aggravation of pain of, of, of sadness that money does buy. And, and that's, that's not insignificant. And, and throw on top of that, inconvenience. I mean, we live in a society of great convenience. Um, money, money buys convenience. Not saying that's always a, a, a good thing, but it's there. And I, I guess if we have one truly valuable asset, it's time. And so convenience means creating more time for better experiences in life. And, and money does buy that. So, you know, to, to, to make the claim that money buys happiness makes people uncomfortable. Uh, but there are elements of truth to it that um, we, I think, not only as practitioners, but as guides or coaches to others, um, need to be able to articulate. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, money buys happiness. I know a lot of people are going to be happy to hear that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think the chapter in my book that covers that, I think it's called Yes, No, Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I do remember that. So, yeah, you know, we, we've spent so much time here on this uh, discussion of money and purpose and kind of philosophical parts of finance. But I, I was just breaking in to the segment of your book where you start talking about more um, specific financial uh, mm -hmm. guidance. And one of the things that you talk about there is market timing, tactical buy and sell decisions. Um, can can we just touch on that a little bit? Because yeah. I just I felt like that was an important thing to to bring into the conversation. People are going to benefit from understanding the difference between market timing, tactical right. buy and sell decisions. I know we're making a hard transition here, but oh, yeah. I, as we run out of time, I think it's important to understand the difference because it's a question that we get all the time. Say, so, well, you know you can't time the market. Yeah, well, you can. I mean, there's, there's just this argument right. that goes on regularly with clients. And I think it's largely just a misunderstanding uh -huh. between market timing and tactical buy sell decisions. That's right. Um, so how to, how, how to get into this. Um, so, you know, I've been in the investment world for more than 20 years. Um, I've engaged with and, uh, some of the most sophisticated hedge funds and, and other investment platforms in the world for, for a long period of time. So I've been behind the curtain and have seen how supposedly the best of the best, you know, billionaires and cents of millionaires, how they're allocating their capital, uh, how they have access to opportunities and so on and so forth. A and one just point blank observation I'll make is that I can think of hardly anyone who has, including those who have every resource in the world, four Bloomberg terminals in front of them, a bunch of digital monitors, analysts, assistants, I can't think of more than a few that know how to time the market. Period. End of paragraph. This idea that you can see what level the market is at and get in and get out at the right time really, really hard. Now, there are professional traders and there are sophisticated trading strategies. And if that's what you want to do for your career, I say go for it. Um, not, pe not many people have a lot of success. A handful have enormous amounts of success. And that's, that's great. But as it relates to people who don't do this for a living, who don't appreciate that every security, even that small cap stock or micro cap stock that you think nobody else has heard of, that there are actually 100 people at desks around the world watching that stock 24-7, that you're going to have some sort of informational advantage, some sort of trading edge over people who do this every day. I mean, it sort of defies credulity a, a, a little bit. So market timing, uh, just not a good use of people's time. Tactical trading, depending on how you define it, you know, uh, let, let me say something slightly different. One of the healthiest things that we can do for our portfolios is rebalance. So you have a certain allocation, take a very simple portfolio of stocks and bonds. And given your time frame, your risk tolerance, any other special considerations, you're 70% in stocks and you're 30% in bonds. Again, this is super high level, a, a little bit crude. Well, you know what happens every day? The market moves. And so your portfolio is going to be out of balance. And let's say stocks rally. And now you're 75, 25. So you're overly allocated to a risky asset that, you know, you had prior said, I won't, you know, given my objectives, I want to be 70%. So what, what do you do? You, you sort of in a, hopefully a, a smart, uh, uh, prudent way, you, you scale back your equities and you scale up your bonds. So you go from, you go from 70, 30 to 75, 25 back to 70, 30. 
that is tactical trading. That that is market timing in, in in a sense. But because it's in the context of a plan that's tied to your goals, which are then in turn underwritten by your sense of purpose, then the whole chain connects, and you have something holistic and I think quite quite workable. You know, I'll say one other thing, which is that. Some of us can't resist the urge to trade. It's fun in the same way that we love betting on golf or going to the casino or great. That, that, that's totally fine. But if you're making your stock and bond decisions in the context of a plan, great. That's investing. If you think, you know what, Amazon is the, the, is the company not only of the present and the future, and it's going to be everything, or, oh, my, you know, this is a, there's no profits there. I hate it, so I'm going to be short. Totally fine, but let's just be very clear about the fact that that's more of a speculative call on a company that you don't know anything more about than a thousand other analysts looking at the stock 24/7. Um, but it might be, you know, you you might be right. Doesn't mean that you're skilled, but it, you you might be right. And I think it's very healthy to draw the line between investing and speculating without casting judgments that speculating is a bad thing, but just to keep it in context and probably assign a relatively small amount of your portfolio to that sort of activity. Mm -hmm. That you're taking part in yourself. Now you say in the book, and there's, there's a difference between market timing and tactical buy sell decisions. And you can't do market timing. You can you can conduct tactical buy sell decisions, but you say that's a different game than what any individual investor or financial advisor should be playing. And I think some are going to say, I mean, sure, there's going to be a handful that go, well, I'm an individual investor and I'm the most brilliant person in the world. But then there's going to be a, a larger majority that are saying, but I thought that's what financial advisors did. Right, right. And, you know, it gets back to a comment from, you know, toward the start of our conversation about, well, what is it that financial advisors do? And going back 50 years, what they did was they brokered securities, stocks and bonds that people couldn't access otherwise. Fast forward half, half a century, yes, they sell securities, but they also build portfolios. Uh, they do risk assessment. They establish goals. And they do some of the other things that we've been talking about for a long time now, which is to create a larger life plan within which money makes a lot of sense. My general view is that if someone is hiring a financial advisor to be a market guru, there's probably going to be some disappointment along the way. Maybe it works out. Um, but if your benchmark for success is the S&P 500 versus your own goals, you're kind of teeing yourself up for failure. Um, mm -hmm. uh, or at least not necessarily failure but disappointment because there's always somebody who's going to be doing better. Your neighbor, you know, bought Amazon 10 years ago and you thought, ah, it's just a fly by night bookstore. And so now he or she has a ton of dough and you feel badly about that. Okay. Well, if we want to get into the game, we need to ask, well, what, what game are we trying to play and what would count as a win? Well, I think it's really insightful to start measuring yourself against your actual goals rather than measuring yourself against somebody else. I, I was just um, trying to think of the name of Rachel Cruz's book, which is uh, Love Your Life, Not Theirs, as mm -hmm. I was just taking a look. And that's that's kind of the premise around the book, right? And I think that, that brings us really well back into financial planning. What are advisors there for to help you define meaning and purpose and help it drive you know, the ultimate plan uh -huh. and make decisions upon that over time then continue to revisit this as a circle where you're always revisiting, updating yeah. the purpose, updating the plan, updating the allocations based on that original decision, that purpose. And that's just why it's so important to have a framework. And I know we're running out of time here, but uh, there's one question that we get asked all the time that I think you'll have a really interesting answer for, a really helpful okay. one for a lot of individuals. And um, um, one of the questions we get asked all the time is, how much should I have in stocks or how much risk should I be taking in my portfolio as I step into retirement? I'm just wondering right. how, how you answer that question. I'm 65, you know, how much should I have at risk? How much should I have in stocks? I think the answer is 47.3% for all people, regardless <laughs> of circumstances. Is that good? <laughs> that's, that's great. Yeah, it brings me back to what uh, your, your friend, Dr. Daniel Crosby said uh, on a previous podcast. He said, you know, it's not about having the best portfolio, but the one you can live with. 
Yeah, and 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 Daniel's the best. He 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 is the leading voice in behavioral finance, uh, applied behavioral finance right now. Um, uh, yeah, so forty-seven point three percent was a joke. That didn't count as advice for me or for you. Let's, I mean, do we have to put disclaimers or flash something on the screen? No. Um, it, it so depends on the context within which we're dealing in terms of someone's balance sheet. In terms of someone's um, expenses and, and and income needs, I mean, someone at age sixty five could be sort of have tens of millions of dollars, but also tens of millions of obligations, and actually be balance sheet poor. Um, you know, it's a lot easier to see assets than liabilities because people love showing their assets. No one loves showing their liabilities, so very hard from. The outside looking in, unless you know, in a seat like yourself, you you kind of get to see exactly what what's going on in somebody's you know financial life. Um, so you know, how much should they have in stocks? Um, they should have uh, enough in stocks that you know, if it's money that they don't need to touch for at least five and hopefully seven years, they're willing to endure a fifty percent drawdown. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's that is that's that's a good enough answer for me. So let's let's end on this note. One final question: um, How do you define meaning and purpose in your life? Uh, it starts with Tracy and the kids. I mean, so I wrote the Geometry of Wealth in part for me. You know, I, I, I turned fifty recently. I've got three kids, a, a wife I love, a community that I love and want to support, and aging parents. So I'm a totally normal guy. So when I wrote The Geometry of Wealth and specifically kind of worked out what's important, you know, sense of belonging, sense of self-direction, you know, my passion for, for, for work and so forth. Those are the categories that I think through these things. Um, but, you know, it, 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 if much of what we're, you're doing, what I'm doing is help people with regret minimization mm. as opposed to goal maximization, I think my greatest regrets at the very end will come from things that I didn't do for Tracy and the kids. That's good stuff. I, I just like regret minimization. Yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good purpose. I think I like that. Oh, <laughs> it's um yes. Yes. And as Charlie Munger, my, one of my investment, <laughs> first heroes, time I've heard that one. In, yeah. He, as, as he says, invert, always invert. And um, like I said, we're wired for more, but sometimes, um, Ha having less of something bad is better than having more of something good. That's good. So, hey, thanks for joining us, Brian. Uh, if you, as you're listening, if you enjoyed the conversation, I know you're going to enjoy The Geometry of Wealth, uh, which has been uh, one of my favorite reads of 2020. If you're ready to really think, you know, this isn't one that you can just flip through the pages. You really need to spend some time reflecting as you're reading this book. And, and if you're in for that kind of a reading experience, I would encourage you to take us up on an offer. Uh, Brian has so generously signed a bunch of copies, sent them over in a box here in our office, and we're going to send them out until they're all gone because I know they're going to offer a tremendous amount of value out there in the world. If you'd like to get a copy of The Geometry of Wealth at no cost, to get a signed copy, you'll only get it here. All you have to do is write a review for the podcast and shoot us an email with your screen name at info at howardbailey.com. If you're not sure how to do that within the podcast app, you can always go on over to retire with purpose.com click on the podcast tab right there on the top it says leave a review the more reviews we have you know that is the currency of the podcasting world so if you enjoyed this conversation if you know that there's individuals out there that it can help that's one of the ways you can help us spread our message so thank you for joining us and thanks for joining us dr portnoy i hope we get to do this again thank you <laughs>